This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Pottage. Please, my guests, share a meal before we discuss our business. The Lord gestures magnanimously toward the dinner table. Dominating the spread is a massive roasted boar garnished with leeks and wild onions, flanked by a plate of venison steak and a plate of pheasant. Wheels of cheese and steaming white manchettes sit at either end of the table, beside terrines of soup that smell of exotic spices. Your mouth begins to water. You've been subsisting on rye bread and pottage for weeks. Whatever this lord is asking, it is almost certainly worth doing just for this meal. Perhaps you can poach a few choice bits to break the fast with tomorrow. Here at the GM Word of the Week, we're American Linguophiles. And as such, we spent yesterday in a state of exuberant overindulgence followed by a state of torpid semi-consciousness. Because that is how we celebrate the Harvest Festival of Thanksgiving. And in that, we are not alone. Many nations have holidays based around the harvest. Of course, the dates vary, wildly partly because such festivals are dependent on the idiosyncrasies of the local climate and growing season, and partly because such festivals have acquired all sorts of additional emotional baggage as various celebration-worthy things have been added to what was once a very simple way of celebrating the fact that you weren't going to starve over the winter. Over the past few weeks, we've talked about all sorts of food. Well. Three sorts of food. Well, one sort of food, one sort of booze, and one sort of food additive. And it was supposed to culminate in a big discussion of feasts and festivals. But we overate here at the GM Word of the Week, and we're tired and lazy. And we realized there's a more important matter to discuss. When the PCs wander into some tavern in Waterdeep, or get asked to stay for dinner by the local farmers whose kid they just saved from ravaging orcs. Just what is on the plate? Just what did medieval Europeans eat from day to day? And that brings us to the word of the week, pottage. Pottage was a staple food, not just in medieval Europe, but across much of the world. Because, although it has had many many names. The basic recipe has remained the same since Neolithic times, and you have probably had numerous meals based upon pottage yourself. How do you make pottage? It's simple. Fill a pot with water. Toss in whatever vegetables and meats you have handy. Boil it for hours until everything has a roughly similar consistency. Allow it to cool. Eat. Yep, call it stew, call, soup, porridge, risotto, whatever. Pottage is just a dish made by boiling your dinner stuff until it became a flavorless, runny mass of nutrients. This remains the basis of traditional Irish cooking to this very day. So, a peasant, serf, or laborer's table usually had a bowl of pottage, milk or water to drink, bread made of rye or barley, and cheese, and the pottage usually contained vegetables, cabbage, potatoes, carrots, and other hearty vegetables. As for meat, pottage was usually made with pork or lamb. Beef was rare. You see, beef is made from cows. This is the sort of surprising fact we strive to bring you every week here at GM Word of the Week. Beef is made from cows. But removing the beef from the cow was the sort of thing you could only do once. The process is somewhat lethal to the cow. The trouble was, living cows could provide you with two things that dead cows could not. Milk and more cows. And more cows meant more milk. And cows were expensive, so beef eating was something of a waste. But what about other meats? Boar, hare, rabbit, deer, game birds? Yeah, those were good eating. And that's why peasants rarely got a hold of them. Hunting for wild animals 
was just not as common in the medieval period as we think it was. There are a number of reasons for that. First of all, hunting is extremely time-consuming. Thanks to World of Warcraft and Skyrim, we think of hunting as pretty easy. Wander the wilderness, find an animal, and yield dragon words at it until it dies. But hunting can be a long, arduous process. As a general rule, the animals that make the best eating are pretty alert and evasive. One deer hunting website has this to say about how difficult it is to hunt a deer, and this is a modern deer hunter. Imagine if you were in your house and a blind man who couldn't hear or smell and used a walker came into your house. And he moved around very loudly and smelled so bad it made you want to hurl. You would know the house like the back of your hand, and he gets lost and walks into walls. You would laugh at him because he wouldn't stand a chance, would he? That's hunting. The point is, even the few peasants who owned suitable hunting weapons and were trained to use them, most didn't and couldn't, couldn't afford to spend days on end wandering around hoping some deer or boar would slip up and they'd get a lethal enough shot that the creature didn't escape before it died. Compare that to having a perfectly productive farm at home that makes grain and milk and pork as long as you just keep working at it. But even if you did decide to take a chance on being able to wallop a rabbit right in the skull with a tiny rock from a spinning leather sock and kill it in one perfect shot, you probably weren't allowed to. See, in the mid to late medieval period, it became illegal to hunt and trade in wild animals. Unless, of course, you owned the land. It all came down to land ownership. The thing was, if you were a peasant or a serf or a laborer, you didn't own land. You didn't even own the land that you farmed. It belonged to a landed lord, which is where we get the term landlord. Now, the landlord very nicely allowed you to farm the land in return for a take from everything you grew. And, in return, the landlord was inclined to protect your farm and your family. That was the basis of feudalism. Now, when you owned land, you also owned everything in it. So, if some peasant wandered out into the woods and killed a boar or deer, he killed your boar or deer. Whether you were using it or not, that boar or deer was your boar or deer. And that is the basis for the crime of poaching. Assuming you're not talking about eggs, poaching simply means illegal hunting, but it comes from the old French word pocher, which means to hide something in your pocket. And that brings us back around to meals, because while the peasant was eating a lunch of hard barley bread and cheese, and eating dinners of pottage bread and cheese, often made with pork or lamb, the noble spread was a lot better. If you were the guest of some lord, the first thing you would notice is that you had a lot of different choices for meat. Those deer and boar and rabbits and game birds that peasants weren't allowed to steal from your forests? Well, those were the sorts of things you set out. That's in addition to the meat that your serfs provided in the form of taxes. But interestingly, with the expansion of meat options came a corresponding decrease in the variety of vegetables. There were no noble vegetarians in the Middle Ages. See, if a vegetable came out of the ground, it was generally considered to be peasant food. Only certain vegetables were considered to be worthy of a lord's table. Onions, leeks, garlic, and rape. Yes, rape. Rape is a type of turnip, and the name comes from the Latin rapum, which means turnip. It also came to mean moving very quickly, and then to devour, and then to take by force, and so on. Interestingly enough, rape is still grown today. It's a very popular crop in Canada, and an excellent form of cooking oil. You can buy it in stores today. What? You've never seen rape oil on the shelf? 
That's because farmers in Canada felt rape oil wasn't a very good name, and they renamed it Canada Oil, or canola. Another interesting difference between the noble and the peasant dinner table, apart from the meat and vegetables, was the bread. Nobles had this tasty white bread called manchette. Instead of being made from barley or rye, it was made from wheat. Wheat was difficult to grow in European soil, and that made it expensive. And speaking of expensive... Another thing the nobility had access to that peasants did not were spices. As trade began to expand through Europe and beyond in the mid to late medieval period and later, spices like pepper, cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, ginger, saffron, coriander, cumin, anise, caraway, turmeric, and mustard became available for a price, for a very high price. And it became something of a status symbol to have access to expensive spices. As time wore on, from the 1400s through the 1700s, the culinary gap between wealthy and poor expanded. The poor subsisted on cheap staples. The wealthy had extensive selections of meat, spices, and delicacies. And as poverty became more and more widespread, the lower classes had a harder time finding meat. So poaching became an increasing problem. Punishments became more and more severe. By the late Middle Ages, poaching was punishable by death. Despite that, poaching became common. Rural peasants developed new tools for hunting, like snares and traps. These were more reliable than the old go out and find an animal and then kill it before it escaped method. And gangs of bandits would organize, live in the forest, hunt illegally, and sell the meat. And the nobility could not count on the peasants to turn in poachers. After all, the desperate, impoverished peasants only had meat because of the poachers. And thus, the black market thrived. Does this sound familiar? It should, if you know anything about Robin Hood. One version of the Robin Hood legend begins with Robin of Loxley having his property seized after he kills a deer in the King's Forest of Sherwood. And so he organizes a band to live in the forest and harass wealthy travelers and poach the animals of the land. But reality grew more grisly. As poverty worsened and poachers thrived, newer and newer technologies were developed to deal with poachers. Authorities could set out spring guns and other traps along game trails or wherever else poaching was common. These traps were designed to injure and maim poachers. Meanwhile, the poachers themselves, who may have been idealistic at first, became more violent and greedy. They would protect their own claims, getting into bloody fights with other poaching gangs and murdering peasants who hunted in their land. Some poachers turned to selling poached meat to nobles who lacked the ability or the desire to hunt for themselves. By the 1800s, though, things were changing. Maiming traps were deemed illegal, and peasants gained the right to kill game on their own farms. But that's well beyond the scope of any D&D game. So what do adventurers in your game eat? They eat bread, cheese, pork, lamb, rye bread, and boiled vegetables. All of it bland and flavorless after being boiled for hours. Until the day they get invited to the Lord's table. But beyond the flavorful, just think about the sorts of adventures you can drive around poaching and hunting laws. Nobles might hire skilled adventurers to gather ingredients for a great feast like dire boars and hippogriff eggs. Elves and humans might end up at war because the elves are poaching from a royal forest because they think the very idea of claiming a forest and all of the animals within it is ludicrous. Lords might employ druids and rangers to protect their lands from poachers and to hunt only in moderation, and those rangers and druids might employ brutal methods to protect the lands. And impoverished peasants might turn to the heroes to protect a group of bandit poachers from the king's soldiers. Or to rob the poachers who have begun to overcharge the starving peasants in their greed. Feel free to poach any of these ideas for your own game. 
This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com. 